Okay, so we are ready to go. So today uh, we're going to cover section 5.3 in the textbook. Uh, and this is sort of a continuation of a discussion of references and pointers and stuff like that that we looked at in the previous lecture in section 5.2. Uh, so we'll be covering stuff like uh, copy constructors, privacy leaks, um, how to basically create a good copy constructor, how to make good accessor functions, that kind of stuff. So one of the um, <coughs> concepts we, sort of software engineering concepts that we have uh, adopted is that we're going to make all of the private variables in our classes, we're going to declare those to be private. And we talked about why to do that two weeks, uh, two lectures ago. Uh, but based the, just to, to refresh our memories a little bit, the main reason we do that is because the folks who implement a class uh, should feel free to use whatever low-level code they want to make the class uh, work the way it's supposed to. And all that the a user of the class should need to know is uh, what the public methods are of that class. So the class can contain other private methods, it will contain private instance variables and all that kind of stuff. Uh, that way if a programmer wants to change the implementation of a class, as long as they don't change the behavior of the class and which methods are public, uh, then the folks who use the class don't have to change their own code. It should work just as well. Uh, and the terminologies we use for that, we talked about API for application programmer interface. And so basically this is the, in a sense it's the, a promise, like a contract to the users of your code, of your classes, that the code is going to have a particular behavior. So this is a specification of the behavior of a, uh, of a class or an entire program. It could be a set of classes as well. And in Java, the way that we realize that concept is through the use of public methods, and we also will have public uh, constants. We talked about that before with class constants. So basically, you specify those things, you can publish it, you put it in your Java doc or whatever, and now if somebody else wants to use their co your code, you can just give them the .class file. They don't need the .java code. They just need your, the compiled version of your code, a .class file. And they'll see this definition up here in terms of what's public. And uh, so with that, you'll be able to write code that then can use these classes. And so that's why I wanted to use privacy. When you go online and you Google up, for example, some information about, um, about a class. So let's do that right now, just for yucks. So I'll go over here and let's do a, uh, let's do this. I'm going to go ahead and make it smaller so it fits on the recording here. Here we go. Still smaller yet. Okay. So if I go ahead here and I Google up, uh, let's do Java, I don't know, strings. Look at the string class. And if you look for the page that comes from Oracle, that's the folks who own and provide Java, you'll see a page that looks like this. Right? And that is the API for the string class written out. So basically what you'll see here is basically all the methods that are public, like that's a constructor, right? A list of all the different constructors that are down here, a list of all the methods, all these are, are public, and on and on it goes. It's quite a big class. The point is that's the API, that's the description of the behavior of the string class. It does not tell you what the low-level code looks like for the folks actually to write those, those, uh, those methods like hash code. There's an implementation for that, but you don't get to see that. That's an implementation detail for the class. You just get to see the interface. And so that's what the API is. 
So the idea there then is that if, if the programmers at Oracle want to update the implementation of String, which they do, in fact, that was a version of String from Java 7 and the current release of Java is 9, uh, they can go ahead and they can change the underlying code. That'll all be the private stuff, the private methods and private instance variables in that class, as long as the behavior which specified in our Java documentation, again, as long as the behavior still does that, then we don't care what the low-level imp implementation is. And by making these the instance variables in our class private, it basically precludes a user of our class, maybe a coworker of yours at, what, a, at a programming firm, from uh, fiddling around unintentionally probably with the low-level information or relying on some low-level information about your, about your class and their code works just fine, later on you go and you make some changes to the low level uh, code in your class and all of a sudden your team, teammates who's using your code, their code suddenly doesn't work anymore because they were relying, relying on this private stuff that they shouldn't have had to know about. So that's kind of what we're trying to do. So we want to have our instance variables be private and uh, so for that to work properly, we have to avoid what are called privacy leaks. And I'm a, we'll have lots of demonstrations of that as we go on in terms of what a privacy leak is and how we, want, how we can avoid it. So <clears throat> the textbook has a class called person, uh, which uh, provides a pretty simple, uh, pretty simple, a simple a class. So you can see here that the, each person has a name, and has, a, has two dates, a born date and a died date. Uh, and so that's all, the, that's all the instance variables of a person. Uh, and you can see that are mixed types. So the first thing is a string, and the, uh, the born and the died instance variables are both dates. Uh, and so we'll kind of talk about what information we want to encode in these uh, instance variables in a second. But you can probably guess what we're trying to do here. It's supposed to represent the name of the person, and the date that the person was born, and the date that the person died. All right, so <clears throat> the first thing for us to look at is how we would design an equals method, because quite often we want to be able to compare two dates and see if they are the same date. Um, and so this is a little exercise for us to go through right now. Uh, and what I'm, we're going to try to write an equals method for our date class. Uh, and it shouldn't have been dates, it should be date.equals for our date class. We want to test to see if, uh, if two dates are equal to others. So, um, Brandon, I'll work with you. We'll try to kind of write one of these out. So we want to write a, a method for our date class called equals, which we could call like is shown there in the invocation. So we have two different dates. You've created them already. We don't worry about where they came from. And I want to be able to test if the two of them are equal to each other. So my equals method is going to be in the date class. someplace in here, you're going to have an equals method. So we're going to make it public because we want other people to use our class and be able to test if two dates are equal to each other or not using code like we had there on the slide. So what's the return type going to be for this, by the way? As far as the updates? Yep, as far as equals. What's equals going to return? Um, whether or not Yep. So what's the data type? That goes there. Is it an int? Is it a string? String. No. Int. What's that? An int. Not an int. No. Because remember, you usually want something like if date one dot equals date two. That's the usual context. So what should this evaluate to? There's a word we have for it. The data type starts with a B. Boolean. Boolean, yeah. very good. All right? Yeah. So it's got, to, it's got to turn true or false, right? All right, so it's going to be Boolean. All right? It's going to be called equals. All right, and what argument should it take? What's the data type? Of, say, date two. E there. E equal. Yep, equals is right. That's the name of the method. So now it's going to have a parameter. Right, so I'll call this other. All right, so the question is, there need, you need, whenever you define a method, you need to, it has parameters like this. All right. 
need to specify what the data type is of the parameter. I'm not trying to trick you. <laughs> right, I, sometimes I'll be thinking things, but I don't want to just blur them off. Okay. So date one and date two are both. Strings. They're not strings because they're instances of the class that we're working on, right? Right, and the class is a date. Right. So it's going to be a date. All right. So this the parameter is date, right? But the code that we had, I'll just put it here one more time, right? If date one dot equals day two, like that, right? Probably up above, I had something like date, day one equals new date, something in there, and day two equals the new date, same thing. So you create the two date objects first, right? And then there's some other processing, something goes on. At some point, you want to check to see if the two dates are equal to each other. So this is what you're going to call. So you know whenever you have equals, whenever you define equals in a class, you're always going to have a parameter which is the same class. You're just to see if they're different classes, then they're not equal to each other. So they have to be in the same class. Okay? Okay, so when you say when they, they have to be in the same class, are you meaning within? I mean in a sense equals is defined inside the class the name date. Right, the brackets of the name date, right? Yep, yep. So I know that because this equals is defined inside the class date, I know that the data type of this parameter is date. should also be a date. Because I'm testing if one date is equivalent to another, another date. date. Okay? And so all equals will look like that. Okay. All right. So we start with that. Now remember, so you can see what the private variables are up there. So there's a name, there's a name private variable, born private variable, died private variable, their string date, date. Right, so the purpose of equals is to determine if two dates are equivalent to each other. All right, so what you want to, you basically want to test, right, those three things. You want to make sure that the names of the two dates are equal, right, that are person, I keep saying person, I should have messed you up. Do I said date, didn't I? That's fine, I meant person. That's okay, should have been person. We're going to follow along there. All right, should have been person. So the person has a name, has a has a date, and another date. So in order to determine two persons are equal to each other, then I have to compare those three fields to make sure they're the same in both cases. Right. So I would have person one, person two, person you know like that. So I got to put that over here. So person. T1 equals new person, right? And person T2 equals another person, like that, all right? All right, so it's kind of similar to what we did with the, um, the diagrams, except we're doing it in actual. You would do the same thing, right? If it's in the person class, it's going to look like this, okay? So. For simplicity's sake, the reason I want to cover date first is a bit subtle. I'll get to why I want to do date first. So let me put down, the, I'll change it back to date. So that will become a date there. All right? And I'll change these back to dates again. Change all of this back to dates. Date. Date. Let's make it D1 and D2. All right, and dates have three fields. Right? They have a month field, so this would be private, string, month. All right? So they've got that private field, and then they've got two date fields. Private, or sorry, not, not date fields, they've got private ints. They've got an int for the year, and they've got another int for the day. For the day, exactly. Okay, now we're good to go. So I've got two dates, that's the private fields for a date. I want to define this equals method for a date. Right? So and again, right, I'm interested basically in this code, right? If I say d1 dot equals d2, do something. So those are interesting to work on, right? All right? 
So that's what we're trying to do. So when I call equals right, in this code, when it's running, right, you can think about the, the keyword this is pointing to is D1. Right? They're the same. And D2 is the same as other. Okay? So that's the mapping. So to get the two to be equal to each other, what needs to be true? Well, I need the month of D1 to be the same as the month of D2. And I need the year of D1 to be the same as the year of D2. And I need the day of D1 to be the same as the day of D2. So basically, when we do that, usually is with a big Boolean expression. So I'll say return. It's going to be true or false. <coughs> so first, I'll check to see, well, are the years equal to each other? So return this dot year equal equal other dot year. All right. Now that just tests the year. So I need the years to be the same, but I also need the day, the month, the day. Yep. So and right, I need the days to be the same. All right, and this dot year. I mean, this dot month. Right. Equals this. I mean, other dot month. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this is not quite right. And I wonder. Yeah, can you see why this isn't quite right? This last line here is not quite right. We do want to test if they're equal to each other. It's really, there's a problem here. We're comparing two strings. When we're comparing strings, we don't use double equal, we use the equals method. So this should really be dot equals other month. Like that. All right, and so now you've got these are equal, and these are equal, and these are equal, and if all those things are equal, then I want to return true. But if any of these things is not equal, then I'm going to return false. There's a little subtle potential bug here, which I'm going to come back to later on, and we'll fix this. Okay, but this is, this is pretty darn good. Right, this is pretty good. Right? And basically, whenever you define an equals method, it's almost always going to look a lot like this you'll just be comparing all the fields against the same fields of the, of the argument that you're passed in. Okay, so the question. Yeah. Within the uh, parentheses or date or other, uh, would, there be a, when there, would there be a comma between date and the date and the other? No, because the word date is the data type of other. If I had a second parameter like this, like maybe I wanted, I mean, this doesn't make any sense, but you could do that. Right, so the parameter lists, you have the names of the parameters, and each one has to have the data type of the parameter in front of it. Oh. Make sense? Right. So, so the, data, the date is the parameter, the parameter type. Yep. And the date is the type. Right. That's the per name of the parameter. Right. The type, the name of the parameter. Right. And these are called formal parameters because they're defined in the method. Over here, when I made the invocation, and D1 and D2 are called actual parameters. So actual parameters when you make an invocation, formal parameters when you're defining the method. And these are also called arguments. The book calls these are calls this an argument, D2 an argument, and calls this a parameter. Just different lingo for the right. same concept. All right, let's put this back like this now. Okay. So that's equals. So now Okay, so um, the next thing is, since we're going to develop the person class, we're going to make a constructor for the class. And remember that our person has the three fields. It's got a name, and it has a, born, a birth date, and a, dead, a death date. So those are the three instance variables. I think I'll go ahead and get rid of this for now. We'll come back later. Let's put that up. 
So we're trying to define, here's our public class person. And we've got three variables. You've got the name, which is a string. Right, and then we had two date objects, references to date objects, birth date, and another date object, the death date. So that's that, that. And we're good. So those, those are our private variables. And whenever, typically, whenever you create a class, you want to make a construct, at least one constructor for the class. So the slide kind of talks about what you want to do. In order to exist, a person has to have at least a name and a birth date. They don't necessarily have a death day yet, because like the three of us in the room, we're still alive. So we don't have a death day yet. Right? So uh, that means that this field, we were going to indicate that, is that we're going to make this field over here can pass, might be null. And if it's null, that's to indicate that the person is still alive. Right, but every person has to have a name and they have to have a birth date. Okay. <coughs> the other thing we want to make sure we put in here is, and this is a, I'll call it a consistency or sometimes called a sanity check. We want to make sure that if there is a death date, the death date can't be before the birth date. It has to be either equal, equal to the birth date or has to follow the birth date. Birth date. Makes sense. Okay, so let's see if we can pack this up on our own. So I'll show you the implementation in a second. Let's see if we can come up with one for ourselves. So let's go ahead and make a constructor. All right, so it'll be public, because constructors are usually public. There's a few counterexamples, but not many. All right, so we'll say public. The name of a constructor is always equal to what? What should the name of this method be if it's a constructor? Yeah. Uh, what? It's a constructor. So we're writing a constructor for the class. So what's the name of the method here? Person. Person, right? The name of a constructor is always the same as the name of the class, right? So person is the name. And because it's a constructor, there's no return, there's no data type. It's not void, it's not in, it's not string, it's nothing. I right? say so public name of the class. Right? And so we said is that there, you might have a couple of different constructors for this. Um, you might have a constructor that takes all three, and usually you would. So let's start with that. So I could say in this case, I'll have name. To make this simple, I'll give these different names. Let's call this uh, new name, new birth date, and new death date. OK, so there is my, my parameter list for the constructor. So this might be, for example, over my code I had up here. Change these back to persons real quick. Person P1 equals person P2 equals new person. And maybe here I would say something like Matt. Right? And I'll need, a, I'll need to provide a date object. Oops, I left off the data types. Dummy. Date. Date. Like so. And so maybe I'll be new date. Uh, and I'll just put in some numbers here. So like 12, 17, 19, 60. Maybe something like that. And new person, Bob. One one nineteen hundred, like 
Matt actually need to provide a second parameter for each of these, so let's do that. So, ugh, running out of room. New date. There. New date, uh, I don't know, whatever. This could be a death date or something, so this could be like 3, 5, 2050 or something like that. Okay. Maybe he's separated by how. Yeah, so I should have had Matt, then new date, comma, new date, and then close paren. And that'll create P1. All right, person one, um, birthday. Yep, okay. because you have to provide in my constructor a string, in order. a date, and another date. The first date is supposed to be the birth date, the second date is supposed to be the death date, and so on. With the second one over P2, let's say they're born in 1900, uh, but I'll pass in the next parameter will be null. They're still alive. And if they're still alive. Okay? Indicating they're still alive. Okay, so that's what I want to do. So now, when I create a new person, I need to basically, remember how the constructors work, when you call the new up here, it allocates a chunk of memory big enough to hold the fields of that object, of that class. So basically it'll stamp out a block of memory, right, that has room for a string and then two date objects. Okay? All right, so those get stamped out, and then I gotta plug some values in. I gotta basically fill these three fields in. Right, so the first field is called name. Right, the second one is <coughs> birth date. The third one is death date. Like that. All right. So usually what you're doing, your constructors almost always look very similar. You're just going to be giving values for all these things. So I'm going to say name gets something, and birth date gets something, and death date gets something. So yeah, what do I want to put for this? Uh, new name. Yeah, new name here. Very good. All right. How about birth date? New. This. Uh, new, new birth date. It's yeah, hard. I, birth I know. This <laughs> handwriting's hard to see. All right. And the same is over here. New death date. Okay. And that would basically set you up, right? This might be null. We don't know. That's fine. Now our code's actually gonna be more complicated than this for, again, for some subtle reasons that we're gonna discuss um, as we go along. But we'll go ahead and, and kind of assume, on the face of it, this is kind of what we want our constructor to look like. All right, I'm gonna show you the actual code now. Well, actually, just to look at the slide here again, it talks about there, there's a need for the consistency. That is, I need to worry about if two dates are provided, that is, if this is not null, like in the first example I had up here, I need to make sure that the death date does not come before the birth date. So I need to make a consistency check as well. And we're going to use a little method called consistent to make that determination. Let's take a look. So this is the actual code in the class, and so you can see, right, we, here's our, this method here that's called consistent, and it's gonna take two dates, and it's gonna make sure that if this is not null, that this date does not come before this date over here. So as long as that's true, it'll basically do something very much like the code that we just wrote. Now it's a little bit different, so you'll see here instead of assigning the born field to be the same as the birth date field. I guess I got those names wrong. Oh well, it was born and died. Change those up real quick here so they match the. This was born and died. I should have checked. Born and died. There, and so I'll check this. Born, died. And I'll keep those, that's fine. All right. Uh, I think it's got to change these two. Yeah. 
All right, so uh, it's a little bit different because we've got, you can see here, this piece of code, right, that we actually construct another date object. And we're going to talk about why we'll do that in a minute. Um, so instead of just signing an equivalent, we actually make a new date object. It's using a copy constructor. We're going to talk about copy constructors in a second, right? And here you check to see if the death date is null, and if it is, you set died to null. Otherwise, you set died equal to, again, another copy constructor. You're making a copy of the death, of the death date object. So, a little more complicated than the code we've written, and that's okay for now. We're going to talk about why it needs to be more complicated, but we'll get there. Okay. So a term uh, to be aware of is the, uh, something called a class invariant. So that just means something which is always true about all the objects of the class. Right? And so it's this middle paragraph here. An object of the class <laughs> person has a date of birth, which is never null, can never be null. Right? And if the object has a date of death, then the date of death is equal to or later than the date of birth. So it's class invariant because it will always, we will never have an instance of our class which does not satisfy that restriction. That'll be true of all the objects of our class. So that means, right, that we're going to have to check that this is true of every object created by a constructor, and it also has to be true of all the methods of our class, if any of the methods can change a person object in some way, we need to make sure that those methods cannot create a person which does not satisfy the class invariant. So we just have to be careful of that. And the class invariant, the class invariant are the name. The name, and we just say anything about the name. Well, we said everybody has to have a name. Right. Right. So, but the main part about the invariant had to do with the relationship between born and die. Right? It's okay for this to be null. That's fine. This can't be null. It always has to be a real date. Right? If these are both not null, then the value of died has to be greater than, that is, equal to, equal to born or follow born. That's the invariant for this particular class, for the person class. And it has to always be. It is always going to be, it's always going to be true of every object of the class. We can have hundreds of person objects, right? Create lots of person objects, but every one of those objects will satisfy that restriction. That the date that um, precedes the death date, if there is one, right. right? And there's always a born date that's never known. There's always a born date, right? And there's always a name. Right. Okay. Okay, so I thought before we go on that we could go about trying to come up with a way for us to design the consistent method. So just a little exercise in designing a method. So up here in this code, right, we had this little statement here. If consistent birth date and death date. So you can tell because it's in an if statement, it must be a Boolean method. It's supposed to return true or false. So let's have a let's have a go at that. Let's see. I think I can get rid of this for now. I'll put it back when we need it later. Oh. For, for person. Uh, for person. The class. You can see because this method is defined inside the class person. Right. So it's it's in there. Now this this is an example of a helper method. The outside world doesn't need to know about this. This is just something us as the folks who are designing the, the person class can use. So we're going to make it private. All right, so I'll say private. It's going to be Boolean. I want it to evaluate either true or false. I'll call it consistent. And it actually looks to me like it's static as well. I think the static has to come first. Private, static, Boolean. So we're gonna make it a class method. Private, static, Boolean, consistent. 
and it takes two dates. This should be D, let's call this, look at this, uh, let's call it uh, early and late, I suppose. I can call it whatever I want. Call it later. Or you could have called them born and died, or whatever you wanted to, it's fine. So what I want, effectively, kind of, if I'm going to pseudocode this, I'd like to say it looks like this. I'd like to say, well, return uh, that early is less than or equal to later, something like that is what I kind of would like. I can't do that because these aren't numbers, so I have to do something a little more, more tricky. All right. So can't do that. The other thing is that this field might be null, right? Because in our code up there, you can see, right? I might, sometimes in the constructor, I'm creating a, a person that has a date, the death date is null. So I have to test for that too. Right? But I need to have a actual date objects here. This can't be null. Okay, so there's a couple different ways you could write this. Let's just check to see first if that is null. Let's see. So I want this to be not null. Uh, so let's say, um, let's do this. If early equals null, okay, that's an error condition. That should never be the case. So probably what I'll do is I'll just pseudocode this a little bit, print error, right? And then you'll call system dot exit and terminate the program. Nothing to do with that point. Okay, so that's what we'll do if early is null. So if we get past that if statement, then we know that early is a date, yay, that's fine. All right, so we have a situation here that that might be null. So if later equals null, So Brandon, what do we think if later is null? So dates, early is a real date, and later is null. Can we make a determination of whether or not the two, whether the two dates are consistent? This one will be a null. Yep. So this one's null, but this is a real date. Remember, we're supposed to return true if the two dates are consistent. And we define consistency as saying either this one precedes this one, or this is okay, but this is null, because they haven't died yet, so there's nothing to test. So if we've checked, we found out, yes, that they are, this is null, then we're ready to do a return. All right. return. True. It is consistent. The two given dates are consistent, as we've defined consistency. Make sense? All right, so next comes the hard part, which is I actually have two dates, and I need to check if one is before or after the other. All right, so to some extent, this kind of depends on what's in the date class. Let's pull up the date class and see what methods we have there that we might work with. I don't know if there's a comparison method here, but I think that there is. Month, month string, read input, that's boring. Proceeds, there we go. So there is a method in the date class called proceeds. Right? That'll return true if the first object precedes the second object. So I can write it like this. So that'll be precedes, but it's okay if they're equal. That's all right. So what I'll do is I'll say return. Right, if the two are equal, that's fine. So how will I test that the two dates are equal? So I've got early and I've got later. How can I see if they're equal to each other? Early, early later. Early dot equals. equals. Yep. There you go. Like that. 
Okay? So if they're both equal, that's true. It's consistent. So if they're that, but if they're not equal and one precedes the other, that's okay too. So that's an or, two vertical bars. Right? So if they're equal, that's true. But if they're not equal, and instead I can say that one precedes the other, that's cool too. So then I'll have early, and you look at your public method you have in the, uh, in the date class, precedes later, like that. Right, because the, the early date can equal the later date. Or, or it, it can come earlier than the later. Before, because you die after you. Yep. After you want yep. And you know by the time you get to this line of code, right, that both early and later are actually real dates. They're not, neither of them is null, because you tested for both of that up here. So they're both actual dates, and it's okay then for you to test them this way. All right? Cool. So, that was the consistent class. So let's go take a look at the code. Now they've basically collapsed some of this, pretty much the same as we wrote. Yeah, I guess it's, it's very similar to what we wrote. I mean, in this case, they actually made, instead of crashing, it would be smarter, just return false. It was supposed to be a Boolean, so that would have been smarter. So if early is null, instead of that, this should have been return false. That's not consistent, because you have to have a date, a birth date. And otherwise, the same code as we had before. All right. You'll notice, by the way, that the programmer has specified, actually written out in the code, what the class invariant is. And although in this example, um, the comment is above the, con above the method consistent, fine to have it there, more uh, correctly, you'd have the class invariant specified all the way up in the header comment first comment of the class itself would basically let, uh, describe what the class invariant is. And that'd probably be part of your API documentation as well. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, we went through the little exercise of defining the equals method for the date class. And so now we're going to look at doing a similar thing for the person class. And it's going to turn out to be a little bit different for reasons that we'll see. So kind of here we go. Um, this is the implementation of equals. Right? So all we're doing is we're using the equals method that we defined for the uh, for the date class, which we already looked at previously. So we just have to check, again, when you're seeing if these things are equal, you're just going to compare the names and the, all the fields. You want to make sure the fields are the same in both cases. So here in the code, you can see right, we're defining the equals method. Again, we have a return type of Boolean, right, equals, and the data type is always going to be the same as the class that you're working in, so person. All right, we have this little check for null over here. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but here we've got the base. This is the base code, very similar to what we wrote uh, when we defined the equals method for the date class. You just basically compare all three fields. Now, when we were working with the uh, date class, two of the instance fields, instance variables of a date were ints, the day and the year. And so instead of having to use an equals method, we could just use equal equal to test if the two ints were the same, same integers. In the string, we had to use equals because it's an object, it's not a primitive type. 
So in this case, all three of the instance variables are references to a class object. So to, de to ter determine if these are equal, we have to use the equals method, not double equal. And so that's why it's written this way. But it's very obviously very similar code. Now you can see on the slide, I circled one part of the code, this dates match portion here. All right. So the question is, why did I write it that way instead of like this? Right, so the line that's changed is that bottom line here. Right? That's different. Go back here. Right, it says dates match, but it just calls a method with the two dates instead of doing this died equals other person died. Why? Why did I have to do that? Consider the value of this instance variable. So Brandon, what might be true about that? About die? Yep. That they... Right, so you've got the die field up here. All right, it's an int. It's, an int. it's uh, not an int, it's a date. Date, all right. Uh, but what might be true about this? We have two different kinds of people in the, in the world. Alive people and dead people. If, if this is an alive person, what's the value of this field? No. No. Right? What would happen if you tried to evaluate that bottom line there? If this is null. Remember we talked about it on, thir on Thursday. Very common error. Probably the most common runtime error in Java. Ah, uh, we did talk about it. Um, it was a something exception. Yeah, do you remember? We were talking about it. It was a null pointer exception. Right, you're trying to call a, a method, a regular method, on an object that doesn't exist. So if that's null, then it doesn't have a month, it doesn't have a year, it doesn't have a day, you can't test any of that stuff. There's no object to call the method on. So you'd get a null pointer exception. So instead, we have to write this method called dates match, which takes the two things to compare. And of course, what it'll do is it'll check to see if that is null. If that's null, that's fine as long as the other person's died field is also null. So if they're both null, that's okay. But if one is null and the other one isn't, that's not okay, then they're not, then the two persons can't be equal to each other because they have different death dates. One's null and one's not null. Okay, so what if they have different death dates? That's fine, then we can test. So, but first we've got to check the null stuff because we have to avoid the null pointer exception. Right. All right, so let's, let's go ahead and write updates match. Right, let's write dates match. So here's going to be, we'll make it private, Boolean, we're still in the person class. All right, dates match. All right, it takes two dates, date D1, date D2. Right? And it's going to check. Right? First it's going to check to see, because eventually I want to call equals on them if I can. Test if the day is the same. But the first thing I have to make sure is, are they both null? That's fine. If one of them is null and the other one isn't, then they don't match. The dates don't match. Okay? There's a couple different ways I could do this. So one thing you could do is you could say, um, you just test to see if they're both null. So if D1 equals null uh, and D2 equals null, all right, then I can return true. Okay, the dates match. If one's null and the other isn't null, then they're not going to match. 
I could return false. All right, there's a couple different ways I could do this, which can get kind of complicated. <coughs> so if d1 equals null or d2 equals null, return false. Okay, now this only works because this line follows this line. Right? If they were both null, I would already have left this method and returned true. So they're not both null. If either of these two statements is true, it must be that exactly one of those two statements is true. One of them is null, and the other one is not null. So either this is true, and that's false, or this is false, and that's true. If they're both false, that's fine. That means both of them are non-null. That's OK. So this just checks to see if either one, if exactly one of the two is null. And then I can return false. So if I get to this line of code here, I know that both of them are not null. They're both actual dates. And so now I can use my equals method in the date class. Return d1.equals d2, like that. All right, and there's my dates match method. So that basically deals with the potential situation where one or more of the dates are null. And that's, and that's for? Um... That's for looking at the code back up there. Again, we're trying to define our equals method for persons. Right, so that, this little exercise was just to show how we can define dates match. Because this is the code we're actually going to use. So we're going to say two persons are equal if they have the same name, if they have the same birth date, and if they have the same death date, which might both be null, that's okay. And if all three of those things are true, then I'm good to go. Okay. So he wrote the code a little bit differently than I did, but that's fine. Works just fine. All right. One thing I want to talk about before I go on to the toString method, I want to talk about why why is there this test here? And I actually we went over this last lecture when I was working with the dog class. And we defined the equals method for dogs. So I added that code as well, a test like that up front. So think about how this might be called. Right? I've made two people. Right? I'm going to get, get rid of person two for now. So I go ahead and I make two people. And there's some more code goes on, and later on I have some, some test that, that looks like this. If p2 dot equals p1. All right, and I'm worried, as I should be right here. All right. In particular, I'm worried about this line. I should have put these the other way. Sorry, that should be P1, that should be P2. Uh, maybe because P2 isn't a sign? Yeah, remember how our equals meant, right, not a sign, exactly. Meaning P2 might be null. Right? right? That's legal. I, I, that's why I erased this, because I, I put some other, maybe something got assigned to P2, maybe it didn't, I don't know, but right now it's just null, right? So if you went now inside of the equals method, here on our code, right, that means that other person, the parameter other person, is set to be the same thing as P2. If P2 is null, then other person is null, Right? And if other person is null, it returns false. 
right? It returns false, which is good, because if this is null and this is not null, they can't be equal to each other. Right? If I had left that out, if I did not included this if statement, and if I just did that, right, then right here, right, when you tried to use the dereferencing operator, the dot operator, the value of other person is null. You'd get a null pointer exception, right? Because there is no other person object. It does not exist. And so you'd get a runtime error, which is bad. So we do that instead. Perfectly okay. So that means if I give you P2 and it's null, I know P1's not null, because if P1 was null, I would have got a runtime exception here. I would have got a null pointer exception trying to do this dot operator here, the dereferencing operator. Okay? So every time you're going to write an equals, it's going to have this structure. You're first going to test to make sure the other object is not null. And then you'll do the comparison of the, all the instance variables of the two objects to make sure that they are equal to each other, however you want to define equivalency. All right, so. All right, so we already did the dates match method, so skip past that. So back to defining a toString method for our class. Usually the toString methods are pretty easy to implement. All you want to do typically, usually it's mostly there for kind of debugging purposes if you want to print your objects out. So usually it's some fashion of printing out the values of the instance variables of your object, whatever they happen to be. So <coughs> we can see here, what you really want is this bottom string, something like that. So let's go ahead and put our two string method here. Get that. Public. I'm going to return a string because that's what two string methods do. It doesn't take a parameter. All right, so you've got a person object, you want to basically get a string representation of the object. Usually it looks something like this. You'll say return, and maybe it'll be something like, no, not string, I'll say. Usually I'll give the name of the class, like person, and then I'll, def I'll give the, the names of the fields. I usually put them in square brackets or something like that. So this could be name, plus, uh, and then I could say born, plus the field born, plus died, plus died, plus, and all of that. And I'd be done. Okay? So just return a string. That's usually what you do. In our case here, it's a little tricky. Can't quite do that because died might be null. All right. So I don't really want to print anything out. So what I want is something like when I when I call like Matt up here, I want to say Matt. So it's a person, and I say, well, Matt, Matt was and Matt lived. I don't know whatever I said up there. Twelve seventeen sixty one. So it'd be like December. 17, 1960, dash, and then the death date over here. But if that's null, I don't have a death date, so I'll just stop there. All right? Something like that. That's what the author wanted to do. So that made the code a little bit more complicated. So he wanted, instead of going like this, he just really wanted to do, instead of as fancy as I did it, he just said mat, then a date, dash, another date if there was one. So the point is, there might not be anything here, but I can't print out null. I just don't want anything at all. 
So what the author does is he makes a little temporary local variable called died string. He checks to see if the died field is null. If it is null, he just sets died string to the empty string. But if it isn't null, then he sets it to the string representation of the died date. And so down here, he just returns the name with a comma, the born date, a dash, followed by the died date, which might be the empty string if they haven't, if they're not dead yet. <coughs> You'll see this pattern a lot, right? So you remember when we were defining the equals method of the person class, we relied on using the equals methods of the date class because these two objects are dates. To tell if two dates are equal, I had to use the equals method from the date class. When we're designing a two-string method for a class, you often have to use a two-string method of the other classes, in this case, the two-string methods of the date fields over here. Right. Now, his code's a little bit redundant because you do not have to explicitly call. Well, actually, you do have to call explicitly. There's, you'll see this trick sometimes. He wrote died, died string. You could have written it this way, died string equals, and I'll put the empty string here, plus date. A lot of people will write that code. Uh, and so when Java sees a string here, this becomes a string concatenation operator, not addition, and says, this needs to be a string, but it's a date object. But that's OK. I'll just call the toString method. It'll convert it to a date, to a string, and then I'll concatenate them together. So you'll see code that looks like this sometimes instead of the explicit invocation of the two-strand method. Either way, it will work just fine. All righty. Moving on. All right. So now we're going to move on to copy constructors. And a copy constructor is a constructor that creates a new object, which is a copy of an existing object. So the signature for the constructor will look always like this. Public, name of the class. Right? And it will take a single argument. I'll call it a ridge for original. And what this is supposed to do is return a new person object, which is the same values as this given one does here. And by the way, the invocation of this might look like something like this. You could say person P2 equals new person P1, like that. All right? So make a copy of P1. So P2 is going to be a copy of P1. Should have the same name, same birth date, same death date, if there is one. <coughs> I wanted to show you in the date class how the copy constructor works in the date class first. So let's take a look at that. So here's the date class again. Constructors are almost always at the top of a file, by the way. You'll have the instance variables, and then you'll have the constructors. So here is the copy constructor for the date class. Right. Again, we have one of these checks we have to make for null. That is, it's possible that this is null, p1 is null. And if it is, I can't make a copy of it because there's no date object, or no, yeah, no, no, no date object. Right. So the first thing I have to do is double check that the given argument is not null. And if it is, it's a fatal error because I can't make a copy of it. Otherwise, pretty simple, right? You just assign Right, the month of the new date to be equal to the month of the original date. The day should be assigned to be the day of the original date. And the year should be assigned to be the year of the original date. 
So that's very, very simple copy constructor. And a lot of them look just like this. Now, unfortunately for us, the copy constructor for the person class is going to be a little more complicated. And this is going to have to do with the concept of privacy leaks, but we're, we've been working our way gradually to talking about that. So we'd like to be able to do this. So if we were just going to um, model our copy constructor on the dates copy constructor, you might think, okay, all I'll do is I'll say this. I'll say um, my name is going to be the same as the origin's name, the original's name, and my birth date will be same as the birth date of the original. And my dive date will be the same as the original's dive date, like that. And I have to have a test up at the top. If origin equals null, then you're going to do you know, an error, exit the program, whatever you're going to do. Otherwise, you're going to go run this code here. Right? And you'd be almost right, but not quite. Right? But not quite. So again, this is the constructor for the date class. And that's fine. Works just great. The problem we have for our person class is these two lines here, the born and the died. So there on the slide, they're labeled in red text, dangerous. And so why is that dangerous? What could go wrong? What could possibly go wrong? Let's take a look. So here's some code I hacked up. It's on Canvas as well. All right. So I go ahead and I create a date object for December 17th, 1961. I make a new person. We didn't write it out, but there is a constructor that only takes two arguments. So it doesn't, if you don't have a death date, you just don't provide that date, that's fine. So it'll set the died field to be null. Right? And then I try to make a copy. So the twin object is supposed to be a copy of the mat object. And then I'll print the two objects out. So I'll print out mat print out the twin, then I'm going to invoke the set birth year method of the person class right, to set the year of that object to be 2002. And then afterwards, I will print out Matt and the twin again. All right, so let's run it and see what happens. Find the other window. Go away. Go away. Where are you, window? Let's lose the dang windows. Too many windows. Uh, I know the text is here someplace. There it is. Drag it somewhere. There it is. Drag it back up. All right, so I have to fix this because I forgot I fixed the code and I got to break the code first. So let me break it here real quick. Copy constructor to make it like it was. Here, this one. Poorly defined constructor is the one I want. So put it back in. that, get rid of that, comment that out, I'm going to comment these two out, like so. I'm going to comment that out too. All of this has to be commented. Okay, 
So that's the code that we wrote up here. Now I'm going to compile this and run it again. Okay, so this shows that something has gone wrong. Because I started out with twin is a twin of mat, right? That's fine. And then I changed the birth year of the twin to be 2002. Right? But look what happened to Matt. Okay. Matt's birth year also changed. Right. I only wanted this one to change, but that one changed too. So what happened? Why did that occur? So let's think about how this worked. Right, up here, when I made a copy of the person, right, I had P1. Let's write out what you know, some of our diagrams like we did in class, our previous class. So I would have had P1, right, and it's pointing to Matt. Right, that was the name, and you had a particular date. You had a birth date, and that was like 12-12-1961. And then I had a null field down here. No, it's fine. And P1 was pointing to that. All right? Then I made a new person over here. So I carve out another piece of memory, same shape, right? String, two date objects, right? And P2 is going to point to that. It actually doesn't get around to pointing to that until this returns. I'll get there in a second, right? So what happens? I run this code, right? So original is P1. So I basically just copy P1's fields into the fields over here. So I copy in Matt. That's fine. Matt copies in. All right. All right, let's think about this. All right. I wrote it out, but we know that's not actually there. What we actually have is a reference to a date object, right? Which is December, right? And then 12, sorry, that's the month, and then the day, 17, and the year, 1961. Right? That's actually what we have. Because the only thing we can store directly in these things basically are, are privates, sorry, are primitives. So that's really what P1 looks like. Right? This is a person object. It's got a string, it's got a null, and this is a reference to a date object down here. Right? Remember, this is like just an address in memory someplace. That's what a reference is, an address in memory. So when I do this and I copy the value into born, I'm basically copying whatever's in this chunk of memory, this little block here, and it's going to copy it into here. The same machine address is going to go here, so you're going to end up with that. And then it will copy the null over here. That's fine. And so that's the situation that I'll have. So then, when I execute this line of code here, and it says twin set birth year, so this is actually, in my case over here, continuing the code, this was Matt, this is twin, Matt and twin, so this is more accurately, this was Matt, gets that, this is twin, gets copy of Matt, like that. I do the assignment, I'll get this. So you've got Matt is a person object, with a birth date shown down here. Twin is also a person object with a birth date down here. Now when I invoke this line of code, twin.set birth year to 2002. So, so go to twin. Twin.set birth date 2002, like that. 
Twin is this. The dot is the dereferencing operator. That gives me this object. Right? So I want to set the birth date of this object. Right? So let's go look at the implementation and see what that does. Or set birth year, actually, it is not date. So year. Since it, since um, the dereferencer is um, is referencing to the date object at the bottom, that would change. That's good. because and Matt's also would change to 2002. Exactly. Okay. It's going. This is going to change this field to 2002, which is the reason why Matt's birthday. Exactly. Exactly. Okay? You've got it. Right? Basically, at the point that we made, the, the way we made the copy this way, we now basically had that mat.born is an alias of twin.born. Right? They're both pointing to the exact same object. There's only one date object, and that's the problem. Now, if you if you if you didn't have mat or twin equal to mat, which is the original person, then it wouldn't change mat. Right. The problem was here when I did this, right? Because remember that the situation of the world looked like this at the beginning when I was doing the copy. I copied this field into the twin into the copy up here, right. Right? and then I copied whatever was in this box over to here. So then I ended up with this. And copying the two nulls, that was fine, no problems there, because there's no objects to work with. But this set up a dangerous situation. Because when you're looking at the code up here, it looks like the twin is completely independent of Matt. And it made a brand new person object, so it's not attached to Matt anymore. It's just its own thing, completely separate. And that's because, and that would should be true, but it's not because we didn't write this code quite correctly. Because we actually ended up with two objects, ostensibly different, but they're not completely distinct from each other. They have this shared bit of data down here. And so if I change that shared data, I'm indirectly changing it for the other one as well, the original. So I don't want that. All right. So what we do instead, I'll go back and fix, unfix this. All right. So when we make the copy constructor, that's for date, one person. Comment this back out. Put this back. So it's a pretty simple fix. All I do is in, instead of assigning born to be original, the same field as this, I use, I make a copy of that as well. I use the copy constructor of the date class to make a copy. So I assign it instead to be new date original dot born. Like that. So now what happens when I get to this line, I'm saying make a copy of Matt. Right? I first I'll allocate the chunk of memory. Right? Then I'm over here. I'll copy the name field from the original and I'll put it over here. <coughs> then I get to work with the what do I put in the born field? That's this line. It says first make a copy of original, which is Matt dot, which is this object, born, which is this object down here. Which was originally 61. Yeah, it was 1961. Let's put that back. But once you get to the next, the next line of code, which is twin, set 
So let's make a copy, right? Because we'd make a copy of this. So I allocate this. Copies up December 17, 1961. Just copy, 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 right? And returns a reference to this new object. And that's what I plug into Born. So I ended with that. Okay? So that's what happens now. So I made a copy of the date, the born date. So it's completely independent of this. And now I'm having this born field refer to that. Not to this, but to that one. All right, so new date creates the copy. It does. And the ori original born date is what is St It stays the same as it was. All right. Yep, so the born of Matt, the original, is the same as it was. No change there. Died is still null, so that's easy. All right. All right. Okay, now when the code runs, so let's, folks back home can see what I'm doing. Compile, run. Okay, now it works the way I wanted it to, right? So after I changed the twins' birth year to 2002, that did change. But the original, Matt, is still has the birth date it always had. Because when I made the change now, the, the field I'm changing is this one down here. So this changes to 2002. But it has nothing to do with this date, this year field over here. Right. I just changed that one. Because the twin dot set birth year independently sets the birth year for his new reference. Yep. Separate. Yep, it sets the birth year of the birth date object. Right. Not, which is not the same as a birth date object for the map. Right, object. because you set a new date in the... Yep, in the constructor right. right here. Okay. All right. Now, to make this work properly, you should do the same thing with died. Right, because if the original object had a death date, then you need to make a copy of that too. And that's why the code is a little bit more complicated. You look at the person, right? You have this ch little chunk of code here, right? So if the original doesn't have a death date, that means it's just null, then just assign that to the, the field down here. That's what we had before. But if there is a died date in the original, then again, you want to make a copy of that as well. I might have a situation that looks like this. He's got another date down here. It's April, whatever, blah, 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 blah. Right? And over here, you'd want this. Again, you don't want this to point to the same day. You'd make a copy of that day, April, whatever, and you'd assign this to point to that instead. And that's what that code does. Right, so in the die constructor, you would change die to die equals new day. Yep, die equals new. You use the copy constructor from the date class. Right. Now the date class constructor was simple compared to this. You didn't have to do any of this copying or stuff. Right, you just did the assignments. And that was okay because these are privates, right, are primitives. They're just ints. And so the way that ints are stored in memory is they'd be stored directly in the boxes. Right, this 17 and 1961 are just ints that are stored directly in the memory. They're not references to other objects. As long as you're just working with primitives, you don't need to make copies of the primitives. Right? You already have that. Basically, these spaces are copies of those primitives. Right? Changing these things from 17 to 15 isn't going to change this 17 to 15 over here. It's a separate number, a separate place in memory. <clears throat> okay, let's take a break. So we're about an hour and a half in. So let's take about a 10 minute break. And we will continue on uh, when we get back. So I'll pause this recording. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and so we did all the constructor stuff. All right, so to kind of wrap this up in terms of copy constructors, um, Basically, whenever you have instance variables, 
that are not primitive types, they're not ants, doubles, that kind of thing, then you want to make sure that you use a copy constructor to create the appropriate object for the copy that you're making. Okay. And so that was this implementation here. All right. Now, one line I want you to look at a little bit is this one here. Because right? you're setting the name equal to original.name like we did over here. Now, I just said that in general, with copy constructors, right, for instance variables that are not primitive, right, use their own copy constructor. So if you have instance variables that are referenced to another object, you should use a copy constructor for that class, like we do with the dates over here. All right? So name is not a primitive. It's an, it's a, it's an object. It's an object of the string class. And so it seems like if I'm going to follow this recommendation to try to avoid uh, privacy leaks, that I should be using a copy constructor for the strings as well. So something like name equals new string original name. And you could do that if you wanted to, but you don't need to. And the reason why you don't need to has to do with strings being immutable. All right, strings are immutable. Meaning there's no methods in the string class that can change the contents of an existing string. And because of that, we don't have to do this. Now before we get there, I want to run through a little exercise. So let's pull up this slide here. So see if you can Tell me what output is generated by the code up at the top. So yeah, if you look at the code, look at the top half of the code there. All right. What output does that code generate? This code right here. So it makes a date object for January 1st, 2006. It sets date two to be the same as date one. And then it sets the date of date two to be that July 4th, 1776. January 1st, 2006. Is it? Date two equals date one. Yeah. Never mind, so it's gonna print out July 4th, 1776. Yeah, what do you think? Is it gonna print out January or July? July? It's going to print out July. Okay, and why? Let's take a look. Because, is it because you said day two is um, equal to day one? And mm -hmm. you individually changed day two to day month yep. to July, but they were sharing kind of like a mm -hmm. reference. Box. It's an alias, right? So okay. this is a similar exercise to what we did on Thursday, right? So if you look at the first line, I, like, I create a new date object, uh, it's January uh, 1 and then 2006, and I store that, the reference to that object goes into date 1. So here's date 1, and that's what the first line of code does. Then I allocate date 2, and there's nothing in there yet. All right. The next, the third line is set date two equal to date one. So it takes the contents of date one and copies it into here. So now I have this situation where both of them are referring to the same object. 
So they're both, they're aliases of each other. Right? So then I say day two dot, I get this object, right? Set date to July 4th, 1776. So this changes to July 4th, 1776. Right? And then the last line is just print out whatever is in day one. So it prints out July 4th, 1776. All right, so now look at the bottom half. Right, so the only thing that's changed is this third line right here. Right, the date two line, that's been changed. Now what prints out? Right, it should print out January now, not July. Right, because what happens now, right, the first two lines are the same. So you'll end up with the world looks like this. Hopefully, I got changes back in January. Right, since you said the new day creates its own reference box. Yep, so that's January 1, 2004. All right. <coughs> so the third line is what's different. It calls the copy constructor for the date class. It makes a copy of this. So it makes a copy. January 1, 2004, and it references that object. So two different date objects, two different chunks of memory in the computer. So when you get to the fourth line, this line here where it says date two set date July 4th, date two dot, that dereferences to this object, so set the date of this object to be July 4th, 1776. leaving this unchanged. So the last line, when I print date one out, it prints out that. Okay. So, <clears throat> I haven't really defined what I mean by the term privacy link. Sorry, privacy link. So what I mean by that is that when we define the person class, right, we set all the instance variables to be private. There's supposed to be like hidden implementation details for the programmer. And yet what we found out was that when we had this incorrect implementation of the copy constructor, changing one object basically caused another object to be changed. Even though those fields were private, changing one shouldn't have affected the other. That's because we wrote the code incorrectly the first time. So you get a similar situation. You can get a similar situation um, with mutators and accessors. Actually, more with accessor methods than mutators. Right. So in the date class, if we wanted to write a, a getter, an accessor, for our private fields, I could write it this way. Let's go ahead and pack that up real fast. So I have so in my date class, that in my date class, you're going to have a private. We know it's a private string, there's a month, there's a day, there's a year, month, and there's a day, day, and year, so I have those. Good. And we write the getters for this, it's pretty straight. So these are private, and typically you have to decide if you have private fields whether you want the users of your class to be able to access the elements of the, of the, of the objects. And so usually we do that with getters and setters, and so you might have public, um, I don't know, string, get month, like that. And all you'll do is you'll say return, month. Simple. You do the same thing for the other. You have a, 
a get day, a get year, they'll be very similar, they'll have the same structure. If you want to have a mutator or a setter, if you want to allow the clients of your program to make changes to that data, then you'll have a corresponding setter or mutator. I'll just make it void for now. I'll say set month string m and say uh, month equals m. It's actually quite a bit more complicated than this because the actual code checks to make sure that this is a valid string. Uh, it has to be April, January, February, March, April, all, all the, the 12 month names. And if it's not, it won't allow you to do that. So that's the example. It wouldn't take that. Take right, it that. wouldn't let you do that. Yeah. Because the class invariant for a date object is that this has to be one of those 12 strings. Right, and the day has to be correct for the number for the month that you're in because there's different numbers of days in each month, and I think the year has to be non-negative, something like that. Whatever. But anyway, so a getter, an accessor, a mutator, also got a setter. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. We could do a similar thing with the person class. So the person class. If we want to say do something with the, the birth date up here, it's tempting to write the code like is on the slide. So I could say public date birth date and just return born like that. All right, and then when you're working with the code right, over here. You might have something like uh, date, m date uh, equals mat dot uh, birthday. It should have been get birthday, by the way. Get birthday. Typical use of a get of an accessor. All right. But you can see on the slide, it's labeled dangerous. This is another example of a potential privacy leak. I say, well, why is it dangerous? What could possibly go wrong? Right? What could possibly go wrong? Right, this is an example. If we wrote it this way, this is an example of a privacy leak. And the reason why is because we're returning born, which is private. Right. But now it's over here. And end date is the same thing. You now have a reference to a supposedly private thing, which I shouldn't have. All right, let's take a look at this code. I'm going to show you the example. All right, so we fixed the problem with our constructor. And now, I'm going to show you the potential privacy leak you can get with improperly written accessors. So this kind of, sh this shows the, the sample code. So kind of like I wrote up on the board here. So I'll get a birth date from Matt and I'll print it out. So I'll print out the, this date here. And then I'll print out the birth date that Matt has. So I'll use the accessor method again. Right? And then I will change the date of a birth date to April 1. And then I just print out after a birth date dot set date. And I basically do the same thing. Print out a birth date and print out Matt.get birth date. So let's see what happens. So it's a similar problem we had that we saw earlier, similar to the problem we had earlier. So the change to the variable a birth date has affected the birth date of the mat object as well. Right? A birth date is 2000, if I got it right. 
<clears throat> no, I didn't get it right. It blew something already. Let me fix that up. I did something wrong. Oh, because I forgot I fixed it. <laughs> I keep showing the stuff after I've fixed it, which is not very useful. Uh, back to the accessor over here. My bad. One more time. I'm going to go down the accessor. Uh, getters and setters are up here. I forgot I fixed it already. Where's the get? Someplace. There it is. I forgot. I fixed it. Unfix it. Now it'll run correctly. Right. Sorry about that. One more time. All right. There. So down here. Right, I called set the date of a birth date, and I got now the two dates are the same. So I changed a birth date, but it also changed Matt's birth date. And that's because I have an aliasing problem again. So in my code up here, what's happening, the way I if I wrote the get birth date like this, let's think what happens when I call, made this call over here, get date. So what I had was, again, I have a variable called mat, and it's re referencing a particular object over here, right? And it's got my name, and it has a birth date, right? And the birth date is a, is a date object, so I have a reference to a date object, right? It's like December 17th, 1961, down there, and this field's null as before, all right? So then I do this m date, mat.getBirthDate. So this is a date object. And this is m date. And so what my method does is it returns born of the object. So mat dot, that's this box here, return the value of born, which is this stuff here. So basically it's an address, it's a reference in the memory. So it copies this value into here. So I end up with this. Right? I've created an alias. Right? So mdate is ref ref referencing this object down here. Now this object is supposedly private. That's what I wanted. But I just lost the privacy. Right? And now this code is not inside the person class. It's in some other class, like person demo or something, or I call it privacy leak. It's in that class. So the code in privacy leak should not be able to access directly the private stuff over here. But now I can. All right? So we get around the problem the same way we got around it with the copy constructors, in that we're not going to return a reference we're not going to return this value. Instead, we're going to return a reference to a copy of this. So we're going to, instead of doing that, we will say return new date born. OK? So now when I call the get birth date up here, it runs this code, right? And it's going to make a copy of this. December 17th, 1961, and we're going to return the address of this, the reference to this object, and that's what we'll store in my date. And now I'm okay, because if I do this, now if I make a change to mdate, mdate.setDate, whatever I want, for one 80 or something, whatever, right? That'll change these fields in here, but it'll have nothing to do with the information over there. So the original object map will be left unchanged by doing this. And so I can put this back in person. So I'll comment that out again, put this one back. 
recompile and rerun. Right. And now you can see after I set the date for a birth, it has, it has not changed the value of Matt's birth date. That's unchanged. Because I've made changes to this, but not to that. So a very similar situation that we have with the copy constructors. We avoid the problems of uh, privacy leaks by basically making copies of things and returning cop uh, pointers or references to the copies rather than the original references that we started with. All right, so I kind of led off with talking about the strings and why it's okay to return a, a reference to strings directly. So for get birth date, I could do that. I could have public uh, string get name for my person class, and I can say return name. And that's okay, right? In general, the analogous situation that I had with the constructor goes like this. Um, for accessors, getters of um, instance variables that are references to objects, i.e. class values, return a copy of the referenced object, like I did with birthday. I made a copy of the referenced object and returned the, a reference to that copy. So it seems like I should do the same thing here because name is a reference to an object. So it seems like I ought to do this, return new string name. And you could do that if you wanted to, but you don't need to, right? And the reason why we don't need to is because strings are immutable. So it's okay just to return name. So I've always been writing things this way with putting strings and boxes here. I actually, in the lecture on Thursday, I pointed out, well, you know, strings are actually objects of the string class. So more accurately, this should have been drawn like this. This is actually a reference to the string mat sitting someplace. That's really what it looks like. So if I'm going to let's change this up here, let's make a person, I got person. So let's say, oops, I want that one there. Uh, let's say I have, so I've got my mat up there. So I can say date, let's do, I get a string, m string dot equals mat dot get name, like that. So following along, what I really have with M string, here's M string. It's a variable. And so when I said mat dot, so mat dot get name, that'll call this, and it returns the value of name, which is this box here. That's the name field. So I'll basically take whatever's in there and I'll copy it into here, which means I'll end up with this situation. Okay. Two addresses in memory, both pointing to the same chunk of memory, which is just where I've stored the representation of the string capital M-A-T-T. -T. Looks like the same bad situation I got into when I wasn't making copies of the date objects. The reason why this is okay is because if you go look in the string class, if you look at the documentation, the API for the string class, 
you will see that there are no methods that change the contents of a string. Once I have the representation string map, I cannot go into this, this data, this memory down here, and for example, change the A to a capital A. I can't. There's no way to do that. I can make a new string, which is a copy of my original, except for that character change, the kind of M-A-T-T, -T, like that. That's fine, but it's in a completely different chunk of memory. So strings are immutable. Right? There are no methods in the string class that can change the contents of an existing string. Because of that, you never have to worry about the problems we've been studying before, where I got two aliases to a date, and I made a change to that date object, and so consequently, I made a change to both of the references. So I can't do that with strings. Right? It's the same reason why when we make a, in the copy constructor for the person class, if we look at the copy constructor, if I can find the darn thing, here, right? we don't bother to make a copy of the name. We just return a reference to the same string because you can't make a change to the string, so you're safe. So that's all right. all right. So for accessors that are references to an object, return a copy of the reference object. But this should really be for accessors or getters of instance variables um, that are references to an object. And this should be to a mutable object. A mutable object then you should follow that advice. But if the object is immutable, you don't have to worry about it. Because you can't get in a situation where you make a change to it. So a class that contains no methods other than constructors that change any of the data in an object of the class is called an immutable class. And it's perfectly safe to return a reference to an immutable object because that object cannot be changed in any way. And the string class is an immutable class. There are others, but that's one. Okay. In the same way with constructors, a class that contains public mutator methods right, that can change the data of the, within the object, then that makes it a mutable class. Those are mutable objects, and you basically never want to return a reference to a mutable object directly. Instead, you return a copy to the mutable object, and then you're safe. All right, we're almost at the end. <clears throat> so deep versus shallow copy. So we've talked, we talked for quite a long time about the copy constructors for the person class. And it turns out what we were actually doing for the copy constructor was we were making a deep copy. So let's kind of roll back for a second. We first started out talking about <coughs> our copy constructor for the person class. So my example I had up here, I made Matt, and then I made a copy of Matt through the copy constructor. And remember that our original copy constructor, the, the poor one, the not very good one, looked like this, public person, person takes a person object, the original, right, and basically I just made it, I filled in the field, so I said uh, name gets original dot name, and born gets original dot born, and died gets original dot died. And I had a little check up here to make sure that wasn't null. So if original equals null, that's going to be an error condition that you're going to exit, but otherwise you'll do this thing. So this was a not good copy. Well, not that it wasn't good. This is now making a shallow copy. Right, 
That's a shallow copy. Because basically we ended up with the two objects up here, Matt and the twin, right? I had Matt referring to my original, which had a string named Matt. Right? And really it looked like this. I had a string, Matt, right? And it had a date for the birth date, whatever that date happened to be. So it's like December, and then it was 12, 7, 1961, sorry, 17, 1961. Had that, and then I had my, and had another, whatever the death date was, we'll assume there is one down here, and then I had twin, and if you use this copy constructor, you would have ended up with the twin looking like this. So basically you'd have two date objects and a string all shared by these two person objects. Now we're okay with the string, because that's immutable, it can't be changed. But we've talked for a long time about the problem with having these aliases here, because a change to any one of these fields is necessarily going to change the value of the other object as well. Right? So this is a shallow copy. And it kind of defines what that is there. A deep copy of an object is one that has no references in common with the original, except for references to, Im to immutable objects like strings. So these have references to the same object or objects. So this is a shallow copy. What we did with the proper implementation of the, construct, the copy constructor was we set it up so that we made a copy. We actually made a copy of all these objects. Let's say this is April something, just put it there. So I actually made a copy of this, December 17th, 1961. I made a copy of this guy over here, April whatever. Right? And then I had this point to there and that point to there. So now they don't have any references pointing to the same object. They're all pointing to distinct objects. The only exception is for the strings up here. And that's safe because strings are immutable. All right, so that's what a deep copy means. No shared references, no shared addresses. All right, and that is the end of 5.3, okay? So we have finished all the material, basically, that you are responsible for for the midterm exam. All right, so for the rest of the time today, we're going to work on a lab. So if you can get into Canvas and go look at the lab, we can work on that. So the lab is, let me pull that up real quick for the folks back home. There's this lab leaky pizzas. That's the one you want to work on. All right, so I'll take you there. Take you here. And so that's the lab we want to work on. So basically, you'll be modifying some code. And you'll be putting, you'll be running the code and then pasting a transcript of the execution into your lab document, and you'll be submitting that. So that's what we'll be doing for the rest of today. Are there any questions from you guys? So I'm going to stop the recording at this point. So just doing a lab from here on out. All right, okay.